Okay, here we are for chapter six, information processing. So information processing is really all cognitive psychology. It's about how do we get information from the environment um, into our minds and how do we think about it and then how do we use it. So the three main topics that this uh, lecture is gonna cover is attention, memory, and thinking. And a lot of this, I think, will be review from what you heard in Introduction to Psychology. But I'm going to be adding in some developmental factors. So things change, right? Your ability to pay attention, your memory, all those skills change with age. So let's start with um, a general overview of what information processing is talking about. So again, I, I told you that making use of that information in the environment, thinking about it, and doing something with it. Uh, the definition from your book is that information processing is processes involved in acquiring and remembering information or solving problems. Sometimes this is imagined as this three-stage process of encoding, storage, and retrieval. So encoding is that sensation and perception information we went over, right? Getting that light into your eyeballs and sense of the brain, getting those sound waves, um, all those things in the environment. How do we get that in? And then how does our brain make use of it? How does your brain categorize it? That's encoding. And then you store it in your memory and then you need to pull it back out and use it, which is retrieval. So this model of three stage process was really inspired by the invention of the computer. Can you imagine a time when computers didn't exist? I can, it was called my childhood. <laughs> so if we imagine like comparing this to a computer, which is called the computer metaphor, then encoding is you typing the information, right? The keyboard, you're typing in your paper that you're writing, your discussion board post. So you're encoding that, it's getting stored in the CPU of the computer. And then let's say you save it, right, memory, and then you need to pull it back up later and you need to edit it or whatever you're gonna do. So you pull it back up on the screen. Hopefully you remember the name of the file right? Hopefully your memory works and you've retrieved that information and now you can use it. So this is the computer metaphor, really comparing how uh, our minds work to the steps in a computer. Okay, so let's move to attention. Uh, you all know what attention means. You're focusing, you're, you're honing in on one thing, maybe, um, that's how you are using your mental resources. And uh, we've got four different types of attention that I just want to remind you of what they are. One is selective attention. So that is when you are selecting one thing to pay attention to and ignoring the rest. Like right now, hopefully, you're paying attention to my voice and to this lecture, and you're ignoring all the noise that's going on around you. Divided attention, that's when you are attempting to pay attention to more than one thing. So for example, I'll just be honest, I was in a Zoom meeting the other day for work, and at the same time, I was attempting to answer emails. That is definitely divided attention. You think you're paying attention to both, and maybe you are somewhat, but you're not doing it that well. So it works okay for very simple tasks like Easy, wash the dishes while I have the TV on. I'm dividing my attention. That is no problem. Answering student emails while in a work meeting, all of a sudden I hear something where they're like, Heather, Heather, I'm like, oh. And then I realize I wasn't actually dividing my attention well. This is really important to note when you are attempting to study and you have the TV on or other things are happening, you know it's just not going well. So divided attention works for easy things, but not for more complex tasks. Stained attention, that's how long can you maintain that focus? And for some things, you can sustain your attention for a very long time, right? Your favorite movie or um, some activity you really enjoy. You know, I'm, I'm hopeful you can sustain your attention through this lecture, but Maybe you have to pause it every 10, 15 minutes and take a break because you start to lose your focus. It's understandable, I guess. So 
your sustained attention. And then executive attention is how you allocate your attention resources, right? So this is kind of, I, I always imagine when I see executive, which we will a couple times in this lecture, as like kind of the boss of the situation. Um, what are you focusing on? Are you able, the executive is saying, let's do selective attention. Oh, now we can divide. Oh, let's focus more over here. Oh no, let's, let's stop doing that because it's not going well, let's do this. Right, so how are you um, really monitoring and using that your attention abilities? All these things are skills, and obviously a baby is not born with these. <laughs> it takes time to develop them, and we will talk about that. So let's start at infancy. So how do we even know that babies are paying attention? Well, one way that we know is through what are called habituation studies. So I'm going to show you this uh, uh, four-minute video. It's kind of old. Uh, but it does a pretty good job of showing some of the classic habituation studies with infants to really look at how they're paying attention and also their memory. So let's go to that and then I will um, go back to our slide. Okay, so this is called the high amplitude sucking procedure. The high amplitude sucking procedure is a procedure that we've used for now almost 30 years. It's used with very young babies, and it was one of the first methods that uh, scientists had to try to find out what babies perceive uh, with respect to speech sounds and other kinds of visual stimuli. In our experiments, we use this procedure to examine what differences babies can tell between speech sounds. And much more recently, what we've been looking at is how babies begin to attend to different information in speech sounds and what kind of information that they remember. What we do is we put the pacifier right here in the baby's mouth and the pacifier is hooked up to a pressure transducer which gives us an output of the baby's sucking responses. We can tell how hard the baby is sucking on the pacifier. But every baby sucks with a different amount of pressure, which is assessed using a polygraph machine in the observation room. Here, the researcher adjusts the sensitivity of the machine to tailor it to each infant's baseline sucking intensity and frequency. With this adjustment, the machine registers each suck while letting other mouth movements pass undetected. Once the baby has established a sucking rate, we start to introduce a speech sound. Kibad, sabad, sabad, wibad, kibad. Wibad, wibad. But we play that speech sound every time the baby gives a hard suck on the pacifier. It usually takes infants only two or three minutes to figure out what is going on in the experiment. And they, once they have established that they're turning on the speech sounds, they begin to suck on the pacifier more and more often, and the sounds come on more and more frequently. Now, as you can imagine, after about two or three, four or five minutes of this, babies get a little bit bored with what they're hearing, and their sucking rate begins to decline. And when it declines to a predetermined criterion, then what we do is we introduce uh, a new period or new phase into our experiment. Researchers can either continue to play the same sounds, and those infants would provide information on how they respond to unchanging stimuli, in effect creating a control group, or for other infants, new sounds can be introduced. Now even two-month-olds like novelty, so it's expected that if babies perceive the difference in the sounds, the sucking rate will increase, and it usually does. In order to tell if babies actually remember the information that they're hearing, we usually introduce a short two-minute period in which we play no sounds whatsoever. But instead, the baby gets to watch a series of colorful slides. Then we pick up with playing speech sounds over again. And if the baby remembers what he or she heard during the first part of the experiment, then we expect that when we change the sounds, they'll react to that kind of change, and they'll begin to suck at a higher rate. All pacifiers are new and sterilized. They are held by an assistant who wears headphones playing masking music, keeping him or her blind to the condition of the infant. And parents are able to observe the entire procedure by watching their child's reflection in a mirror. The kinds of things that we study using the high amplitude sucking procedure really have to do with basic capacities that all infants have to learn any language. T is for top. It spins on its tip. 
And indeed, it has been shown that babies have a lot of capabilities within the first two or three months of age. But these abilities are universal in the sense that we expect to find them from infants, in infants from any culture. What happens, though, is that around five or six months of age, babies begin to learn more about the particulars of their own native language. Do you see a monkey? And in this area, that would be English for most families then we can start to ask different kinds of questions about what they're learning about their native language. Now, because the high amplitude sucking procedure only works with infants that are about two or three months of age, we have to use other kinds of procedures to be able to ask these kinds of questions about what babies are learning about their native language. Okay. So, this is just an, an excellent overview of a habituation study. And in this study, uh, the researcher, uh, Dr. Jusik, is studying memory, attention, and language. All things that are in this information processing unit. Well, uh, well no, not language. Mm. Oh yeah, thinking. Okay, I got it. Language is gonna be one of our, our next week's videos. Anyway, we'll probably revisit that idea in the language section also. So basically what he's showing in a habituation study is that babies are paying attention when you see this increased response to new, okay, let's go through these things, to new information is exciting. It holds their attention. This is called dishabituation, right? This increased sucking response, an increase in paying attention to new things, novelty. That's what novelty means. Babies have a preference for looking at new information, hearing new things. Habituation is when the baby starts to get bored and they're like, ah, I've already heard the sound over and over again and the sucking rate on the pacifier goes down, which indicates they're not very interested anymore. So that is the technique for studying attention and memory, and in this case also language, in a habituation study. You're looking to see what holds that baby's attention, what is interesting to them, and do they recognize information that they've already heard or seen before. Okay, so those are habituation studies. And that's just a really cool way to do research in this age group, just a couple months old. Another gain in attention that is important to, to notice in infancy is what's called joint attention. So babies are, are paying attention to lots of different things, but joint attention is when the baby knows that the mom or dad or whoever they're interacting with is trying to get them to pay attention together to something else. So mom, Easy example, mom's reading a book to the baby and she's talking and saying, oh, A is for apple. And the baby's like looking at mom because mom's talking and mom's pointing at the apple and saying apple. And joint attention is the baby recognizing I'm paying attention to mom and she wants me to pay attention to this picture and she's saying words that go with the picture and all her and I are both together looking at this. This is joint attention. Um, it's a really key development in infancy. And uh, I, we're not gonna get too much into the uh, disorder of autism, but this is a skill, joint attention, that is clearly not developing in kids with autism. And it's something that can be detected very early in life. Okay. So let's move into our next area of childhood. And I'm gonna put childhood and adolescence all together. You see increases from age three to 20 in all the different types of attention, right? Selective, divided, sustained, and executive attention all gets better and better every year of age. One interesting thing that you see improvements in is what's called salient versus relevant dimensions. So when a child is let's say at school and there's all the kids and the teacher, the child often has trouble figuring out what's important that I need to be paying attention to because there might be a kid over here who's 
doing jumping jacks for some reason, but I'm supposed to be listening to the teacher's instructions. Well, a lot of times the child is only going to remember or pay attention to what is salient, which means what is really sticking out and is obvious and is grabbing your attention. And that's what they remember instead of the relevant information. As you get older and even moving into college, I've seen this in with college students where they remember a really great example, a story about a concept, but they don't remember the concept. They're like, I just remember this great example. And so that's paying attention or remembering just that salient information that catches your attention and not the relevant information that you really need to know. So this can be a big problem in childhood, well, not problem, but this is just how attention works. And over time, as you age, you get better and better at figuring out, okay, that's grabbing my attention, but it's not really relevant. So I'm gonna focus on the relevant information. Okay, moving into adulthood. This is as good as your attention is going to get. Um, don't be concerned. Uh, a lot of times adults feel like they're not good at paying attention, but it's just because there's so much going on. But this is the, the best you're going to be, your peak. And then when we move into older adulthood, we start to see some declines. Declines in selective attention. So, oh, my power is going out. It's storming right now here. Okay, anyway. So um, you start to see a decline in your ability to really focus and ignore stuff. So that's selective attention. And you start to see some declines in your ability to divide your attention, right? Maybe even to the point where you you got to focus on washing the dishes. You can't have the TV on at the same time or you might make some mistakes. Okay, so let's move into our second topic of memory. So this first few slides are going to just be review, uh, and I'm going to try really hard not to talk a lot because I could spend hours on this. Uh, but first, let's just get all on the same page, remembering what is memory. Memory is not a perfect recollection. It is not hitting rewind and play. Your memory is not like a series of YouTube videos. Your memory is reconstructive, right? So you think to yourself, what did I do yesterday? and then you start to reconstruct the events. It's not um, perfect. In fact, we make a lot of mistakes with our memory. Okay, so with that in mind, we can move to our very uh, well-accepted three-stage memory model. There's gonna be a lot on the slide. You can always pause it to take a look. So our three-stage memory model is composed of sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. Hopefully this looks familiar, right? Your sensory memory is those first few seconds. You're encoding, you're getting sounds, you're getting visual information. You hold that for a few seconds and figure out, am I paying attention to this and I need to know, or am I throwing it out, right? So you can have about 14, 17 items in your sensory memory just for a few seconds. This is why my favorite example for sensory memory is when someone in the other room says something to you and you weren't really paying attention and you go, what? And then you know what they said. That's pretty cool because your sense, your memory holds on to that information for a few seconds. So if you realize you need to know what that is within that time frame, it's all still there and you can use it. But occasionally, right, you say, what? But it's been too many seconds and the information's already been thrown out. Okay, that's sensory memory. So if you pay attention, right, selective attention, that information you're hearing or seeing or smelling or whatever it is gets moved into short-term memory. This is where all your thinking is going on, which we'll talk about thinking at the end of this lecture. So you can hold about uh, seven plus or minus two items. Sometimes that's called like the magic number seven. So what this means is if you have been given a string of numbers to remember, you will remember somewhere between five and nine items. Now this does change across the lifespan and you can hold information for about 30 seconds. But if you're thinking about it actively, then you can hold it for much longer. So if you paid attention to this information, it's important, you've been thinking about it, then hopefully 
right? That gets passed into your long-term memory, which we'll talk about more on the next slide, right? So this could be hold, held potentially forever, right? Lifelong memories, lifelong information. You probably don't remember when you learned that the sky was blue. It was a long time ago. That's a piece of information in your long-term memory. Uh, so this is all stored potentially forever, hopefully, right? Long enough for you to take the exam. And then you want to pull it back out, right? Retrieve it back into your short-term memory so you can think about it and act on it. Okay, hopefully this is all familiar. Let's look a little bit closer at our long-term memory. So there are ways of talking about the different types of long-term memory. We can divide it into two categories. This orangey group is what's called a explicit memory or sometimes declarative memory. Explicit memories, for me, I just think those are memories that are easy to talk about, easy to verbalize. You can use words. Implicit memories, which we're not really going to do much discussion of, are memories that are hard to talk about. They're hard to verbalize. They're more about memories from motor skills, automatic classically conditioned responses, or even priming, which is when you see something or hear something, it kind of primes you for a response, but we're not gonna get into any of that detail. These are hard to verbalize, right? Um, the example I usually use is, um, imagine how, imagine trying to describe verbally how to ride a bicycle. It's not easy, give it a try. Pause it, the video, and try to talk through how you would teach someone to ride a bicycle without using your body parts, just words. It's not easy. Okay, let's focus on the explicit memory, memory that is easy to talk about. We can put that into two categories. One is semantic memory, which is memory for facts. Like in this example, bananas are yellow. There's 12 months in a year. Spiders have eight legs. These are facts that are separate, really, from your personal life experiences. Episodic memories are sometimes called autobiographical memory. This is memory for your personal life experiences, right? Your high school graduation, the birth of your first child. So those are personal to you. Most people in the same, um, who live in the same area, speak the same language, grown up at the same time, we've got the same semantic memories. Pretty similar. Okay. So what's going on with memory across the lifespan? In infancy, the study of memory goes to these habituation studies. We can see implicit memories for um, motor skills is emerging by two months. The baby learns if I jerk my leg like this, I can hit the button on that toy and it makes a noise and then I'll repeat it, right? That's a procedural memory. So those implicit memories are starting to develop. Ex explicit memories are also starting to develop. However, I will say that explicit memories are, are heavily tied to language. So babies certainly are recognizing things. Um, their mom and dad's faces, their dog, their toys, those are all explicit memories. There is a phenomenon that's called infantile amnesia, and this is the fact that the majority of people, overwhelming majority of people, have no long-term memories of anything before age three. Now, of course, one of you, I'm sure, has a vivid memory of breaking their arm when they're two, two years old, right? <laughs> but the majority of us have no um, long-term memories that go back before age three. And this is heavily tied to language because for that memory to be strengthened in your brain, you would be talking about it, sharing it, repeating it. And that's what strengthens these long-term memories. So that's our understanding of why you might have no memories before age three. Now let's move to age three to five, early childhood. Autobiographical or episodic memory increases significantly, right? Kids can talk about in preschool. They went to the zoo, they had a birthday party, um, their favorite TV show, all of these things. However, uh, some of these memories, like let's say they went to the zoo, these do start to fade pretty quickly. Where I might remember that my last trip to the zoo, which was years ago, 
a, a three or four year old, after about six months, they're going to start to forget about it and not really remember that they had been. So that those memories aren't really sticking around as long as you would expect a memory like that to last uh, for an older individual. Early Kids in early childhood are also highly suggestible and their memories are not good. And an example is just, um, in my own experience, we had told a story many times about something that happened to my older son. And then one day, my younger son, who was about four, started talking about it like it had happened to him. And I'm like, that didn't happen to you. That was your brother. That wasn't you. And he's like, no, 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 it was me. He had heard the story a whole bunch of times and he thought that that had happened to him. But it's just not true. Um, it's very easy to kind of hear these stories or uh, even kids watching TV shows and starting to confuse what's real, what, what was my personal experience, what wasn't. And you can convince a kid of um, a lot at this age, so be careful. <laughs> and then also in early childhood, kids start to develop prospective memory, which is um, remembering that you have something coming up, right? Oh, I'm going to the library this afternoon. In two days, it's my birthday, right? That's prospective memory that starts to develop. Okay, middle childhood. Now we're going to school, you're in elementary school, you start to develop meta memory, which is your ability to think about and assess your own memory, right? You all have this skill. You think, do I have a good memory? You're studying and you think, am I remembering this information or not? And in school, kids will be learning very specific memory strategies like rehearsal, elaboration, and memory aids. Rehearsal is just repeating something over and over and over again, right? You've got your stack of flashcards, you look at the thing, you flip it over, you read the definition a couple times, and you hope it sticks. That's rehearsal. It's not the best memory strategy, but it's one that people keep using. Elaboration is what I try to do in these videos. Take a concept, Think about what it means and then relate it to information I already know, experiences from my life or other interesting examples. That's elaboration, thinking more deeply about a concept and trying to relate it to things you already know. And then external memory, it's very helpful, right? You can use um, imagery, you can use um, my favorite, which is altering your environment. Right? So if I've got to return library books and I keep forgetting them, well, I just stack them up right by the front door so that I would have to trip over them or pick them up and take them to the library. That's also an external memory aid. And you can set things up in the in your environment as a kid to help you remember, um, oh, here's my clothes that I have to wear in the morning when I get up. You have to go to baseball or whatever it is. Okay, moving into adolescence, dramatic improvements in memory and knowledge, right? You're in high school, middle school, high school, going into college, you're learning so many new things, you're really learning how to use that memory, and you're developing metacognition. So cognition is thinking, and meta means that you're thinking about your thinking, which also includes your memory, right? So you can say to yourself in adolescence, how am I thinking about this concept? Am I really getting all the information? Are there more things I need to know to make this decision? And those are really important skills. In adulthood, congratulations, your memory's as good as it's gonna get. Um, I'm past young adulthood, so making lists is really important. If it's not on the list, I don't remember it even exists. <laughs> Okay, middle adulthood, age 20 to 40. Um, here's some interesting uh, it, things that happen to your memory. One is the reminiscence bump. The reminiscence bump is the fact that for some reason, um, the memories from your 20s and 30s seem to be the most vivid in adults. So going into, you know, your age 40 and up, you're like, oh, I remember my college years. I remember those friends. I remember my first job. All those events from your 20s and 30s seem to be really prominent. That's the reminiscence bump. You also start to experience some declines. 
one common thing, which happens to everyone, but it starts to happen more and more as you get older, is the tip of the tongue phenomenon. This is when you say to yourself, oh, I know, I know this, but I just can't think of the name of that. It's right on the tip of my tongue. That's where this name comes from. You also start to see declines in source memory. This is fun, funny to me because it's happened to me so often. Source memory is when you remember the information, but you don't remember the source. You don't remember where you heard that from. And there have been so many times, especially at work, when I'm talking to my colleagues, other professors, and a professor will come up to me and go, oh, you'll never believe what I heard, blah, blah, blah. And I'll say, I told you that yesterday. <laughs> She'd be like, what? Oh my gosh, I totally forgot where I heard that. That's not so good, especially if you're trying to be a critical thinker of information or news sources. If you can't remember where you heard the information from, it's not good. Okay, um, and prospective memory starts to decline. This is, again, your ability to plan for what's happening next, remembering that you have a doctor's appointment tomorrow, remembering that you have your library books do. You might have to uh, develop some good memory strategies, like I've got all my reminders in my iPhone and got to-do lists all over the place. Okay, lastly, late adulthood. We start to see some declines in some of our more basic um, memory functions, like our short-term memory. So I talked about how the magic numbers around seven items, five to nine items that you can hold in your short-term memory, you might just see, see some declines in this, and now maybe it's th four or three or four items you're holding in your short-term memory, your ability to ma manipulate complex information in your short-term memory starts to decline. You might see some long-term memory decline, um, sometimes more, it depends, right? You can spend time with a person who's 80 years old and they've got vivid memories from that age 20s and 30s, right? Those reminiscence bump but they might have trouble remembering what they did yesterday or two weeks ago. I will say it's not always a memory problem. Sometimes it's more the fact that if your days are very similar, then it's very hard to distinguish one from the other. So asking, what did you have for lunch yesterday? When your lunches and your schedule is so similar, can be kind of confusing to remember. So that can hamper your memory, but Anyway, long-term memory declines for some. Um, some episodic memory, uh, your personal autobiographic memory can decline in some individuals. An interesting um, thing to look at in late adulthood is meta memory. So again, the way you think about your memory, there are certainly a lot of negative stereotypes about memory in late adulthood. That you're terrible at remembering things and you're confused a lot. This is not always the case. However, a lot of older individuals believe these stereotypes or express them frequently and say, oh, my memory's horrible, I'm terrible at remembering things. Yet, when we look at actual memory skills, their performance is not as bad as they predict it to be. So their thoughts about their memory are often different from their actual memory abilities. And then it's also important to note because so many older adults are on medication, that some medications can have side effects that affect your memory. Okay, our last topic um, and our my shortest one to discuss is thinking. All right, so here's the definition from your book, manipulating and transforming information in memory to reason, reflect, think critically, evaluate ideas, solve problems, and make decisions. That's kind of a long sentence, but that's what you're doing, right? Thinking is about evaluating information, trying to make decisions, trying to figure out what you're gonna do. Thinking is going on in your working memory. Now, I've actually already said that thinking is going on in your short-term memory. Your working memory is in your short-term memory. Okay, so if we think about sensory, short-term, and long-term memory, and short-term memory is whatever's actively going on right now in your thoughts, that is where working memory is. Okay, so you've got your working memory that's visualizing and organizing information, imagining 
um, anything you want to imagine visually. You've also got working memory that is verbal, that is your own voice talking to yourself or making lists or however it is that you're thinking. All of this though is occurring in short-term memory. This ability to think in words and to visualize and manipulate visual information is developing in childhood and just gets better and better across the lifespan and then you start to see some declines in older adulthood. Your processing speed, right? So how quickly can you think? How quickly can you evaluate information or make decisions? Definitely there are declines in older adulthood. You start to see it takes longer to make a decision. It takes longer to figure out what the right choice is. Now, it, that longer time may result in a really good answer, but it still takes longer often in older adults to make those decisions and to process information. And then lastly, I can list some things that do improve with age. Even into older adulthood, you can see some improvements if you're not trying to time people to make them do these things quickly, <laughs> right? One is executive function. So this is in your, your working memory, right? How do you allot these resources? You've got to use your attention, you've got memory, you've got decision-making, you've got to hold all this information in your mind in different formats, that's executive function. So your ability to do all that and organize all your information, figure out how you're gonna think about things, that improves with age for sure. Your ability to do critical thinking, that improves with age and life experience. So critical thinking, is this is my favorite definition. <laughs> critical thinking is thinking about your thinking while you're thinking in order to make your thinking better. So your ability to do that improves with age. There are a lot of impediments to critical thinking that we've talked about in previous lectures with our adolescent um, thought that imaginary audience, personal fable, all these things impair critical thinking and make it harder for you to realize that you're not seeing the whole picture. Life experience, moving into that post, post formal thought, those types of uh, ways of thinking really help with critical thinking. Decision making improves with age. I can attest to this. A lot of times emotions are involved with decision making and can make it difficult for people to make the right decisions. Once you are much older, it's much easier to see the whole picture and what's really important. And um, maybe knowing that sometimes those intense feelings aren't really the crucial thing that needs to be looked at in making a decision. And so older individuals are much better at that. And then of course, expertise. You're not developing expertise in your career field in the first year, right? It takes years of experience to become an expert. And that's something that you see in older adults. Um, they may have some declines um, in slowing of memory or other areas, but they make, can make up for that with their knowledge and expertise in that area. Okay, this is uh, the end, and um, we're gonna talk about next week intelligence and language.